Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vineyardchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vineyardchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. Now here's this week's message. Good morning. Good worship. Love it. We are um, going to be talking about um, how to get involved in a church. Now you say, well, why do I talk about a topic like this? It's because first thing I think it's good just to remind yourself, you know, hey, is this, this the place I need to be? If so, am I doing what I need to be doing? Uh, and just kind of re-sign up. There's always value in that. Other times, you know, some of you might might not be uh, part of the vineyard. You might not be part of a church at all. And so you're deciding. And of course, this is right, uh, right down the pike there for you to kind of decide, hey, maybe is this the place? What kind of questions should I be asking? Maybe you know somebody who is not uh, in, actively involved in a church and you could, you know, help them. And so you'll want to, you want to pay attention so that uh, you, you might move at some point. If you were to move, these are the things that you'll want to be considering when you're thinking about how do I get involved in a church? How do I, how do I actively uh, jump in with both feet and, and get the most out of it? It is important. Uh, we, talk, we, we have a, about every six weeks or so, we do a membership class where we talk about uh, getting involved in a church. We talk about some of these, some of these attributes. And usually I teach that. Sharon and I teach that because I want to I wanna meet all the people that are interested in getting involved in, in, in our church. And one of the things I talk about, it's not in the curriculum we go through, but I, I, I bring this up. I say, you know, we're talking about joining Vineyard, but, you know, it's equally as important to know how to, to uh, uh, when, when, if, if you're going to leave a church, how to leave a church. Not everybody's going to be buried, you know, uh, outside in the parking lot. I don't think we have burial plots out there anyways, but you know what I'm saying. I'm, uh, that'd be kind of weird, right? But you know, some churches do that, right? If you're a lifelong member, you get to be buried right there. Well, not everybody's called to be buried at their church, you know. So, so we understand that life brings different seasons. And, and uh, so how do you leave a church? That's important to know how to leave a church. Let me tell you, how to, just before we get into how to join a church, how to get involved, how to leave a church. So here's how to leave a church. Here's what not to do first, okay? What, here's what not to do. Don't just disappear. You know, and then somebody someday says, whatever happened to Susie? You know, I don't know. You know, where is she? You know, or what happened to Frank? And, you know, he's just, I don't know. It's, it's been months, I guess. You're right. He must have left. You know, that's probably, that's really not the best way to go. The reason people do that is that they really don't know how. It's not just churches. People don't know how to, how to transition well. They don't know how to, trans, transitioning is some of the hardest things to do in life. When it's transitioning jobs, just from department to department, or from company to company, or when it's time to move out of your neighborhood, when you're, when you're, whenever you're making a change, when you're helping your kids leave the home and you're, you know, they're going to transition into a new part of life, all of those things, those can be very difficult. So a lot of times people just don't know. So they just kind of shut down. They go, well, I just, I won't go again. That, that, that is not the best way to do it. For one reason, you're not growing in that area. You're, you're kind of making awkward relationships. If I see you at Walmart a few months later, you know, you're, it's like an awkward conversation. I, you know, some people, we've, I've been ministering here in this area now for 30 years. 22 at this church, had seven years at another vineyard that we helped start. And so that 30 years is a long time. So I, I mean, I'll, if I, there's times where I'll be shopping at Walmart and somebody will come up and then they'll turn around and leave, you know, and I, you know, there's no need for that. You know, kids, we got to go, you know, there's the pastor of the church. I never said goodbye. So <laughs> we're all on the same team. You don't need to do that. So it makes it a lot easier if you just one more week, you just come to church and you say goodbye. Now, here's my, here's what I want to promise to you. I'm not going to weird you out. I'm not going to weird out on you. I'm not going to shame you, make you feel bad, put a guilt trip on you. The Lord bless you. I'll just pray for you and we'll be friends. And then if we see each other at Walmart, things are good, right? So that's, that's the way you do it. Is you don't have to send an email. Just come. Just say, hey, I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I'm going to, God's doing something different. That's cool. So let's talk about how to get involved in a church. Well, 
as a church grows, a church that's small can be very homogen- homogeneous, right? Very, very similar. As it gets bigger, it demands more diversity because that's just what makes a bigger church. That's why most churches in the United States are about 70 people or less because many, many churches, they, they, everybody wants to know each other. They all want to be very similar. And, uh, but you break, once you start to go into multiple services, you get to, you just, it demands more diversity. It demands more freedom for people to express themselves differently. You're not all going to be the same and that's okay. In fact, you see this all throughout the Bible because it's a very diverse area where, where the, the New Testament started out. And so Paul's writing about how to get along all throughout Corinthians, specifically in 1 Corinthians 14. He says, okay, let's summarize some things. Here's some things that you need to do in order to, you, to, for you guys to, to do well, to have unity, to get along. Not uniformity, but unity. Here's one of the things he says, this line. He says, but everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. So he's talking about all these different spiritual gifts and talents, different things people bring to the table. He says, yeah, all, let's bring it all in. Let's let it all happen. He goes, but let's do it in a fitting and orderly way. We got to have some organization and we got to have some structure. So both of those are important. And one of the things we want to do is, is invite people to be themselves, to have spiritual freedom, to grow at their own rate and their own way. But at the same time, we have to have some kind of structure to it so that it all kind of, it's not just, uh, an amorphous mass, but it's got, it's got some substance. There's some kind of organization to it. And that is, is uh, part of the way the church is supposed to operate. Notice in Ephesians 2, 19, it says, you are members of God's very own family, citizens of God's country, and you belong in God's household with every other Christian. Very, very important verse about your place in the church, your place. Notice in fact, circle these three words, member, family, belong. Member, family, belong. We see two truths that come out of this. Number one is, is that the church is a family. Now, this is good news. The church is not an organization. And I know some churches have org charts and all, but ultimately, the church, the way God sees it is, it's a family. It's a family. It's, it's, it's not a building. It's not a religion. It's, it's a family. That's why it's based on relationships and not rules. And so as a family, this is a good thing because for many of you, your family, your extended family is somewhere else. They don't live here. And so that's a wonderful thing to have. This is kind of your extended family. If you're a believer, your family, your extended family is the body of Christ. And so you're part of of, of, a, of a church family. And you see this all throughout the New Testament, people belonging to a specific family. You, you, you've got a family you're part of. And, and you're not just wandering around without any kind of, uh, of, of association. That's part of what he says. Is he goes, you belong. Notice he says, you belong in God's household. There's, there's a belonging. So you're not just a believer, but you're a belonger. In fact, the part of the way you prove you're a believer is that you belong. If you see, if you read the New Testament, you don't see Christians that, that didn't belong. That happens in America, but it didn't happen. In fact, all throughout the, you know, all throughout the world, really, that, that's, if you're a believer, you belong somewhere. Here we kind of have this Lone Ranger thing going on, you know, where it's, you know, I talked to a lady last week. She goes, well, I'm a Christian, but I don't need to be part of a church. You've probably heard this. I'm a Christian. I don't need to be part of church. I don't, I don't need other, other, other people. Well, that's not true. We actually do need each other. Part of the Christian walk, part of what it means to be a Christ follower means we walk not only with Christ, but with other, other believers. We need each other. We draw the best out of each other. We help each other. Romans 12, 5 says, In Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to who? To all the others. It says that's what it means to be a Christ follower. You belong to somebody else and you, they, they, they belong to you. It's, 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 it's part of what it means to be a family. Now, of course, in a family, you're always going to have some odd people, right? Yeah, they're, they're kind of odd. Well, you know, the Bible says that we are a peculiar people. So one of the, one of the things I like to say is, is, are they peculiar? If they are, well, that's, they're, part of, they're probably part of the family of God, you know, because we're a peculiar people. And we are peculiar, 
people were peculiar to others. Others are peculiar to us, but it's part of what it means to belong to belong to a family. Now, how do you find the right family, the right, the right uh, church for you? Well, here's four things. If you ever move, you'll want to make sure and remember these four things. These are the ways that you find out and you use these as a, okay, is this happening? Because this is part of the way I'll know this is the right church for me. Number one is this, it should help me stay spiritually motivated. We need that. We are in a long race. We just came out of the Olympics watching those. That's hard to stay motivated day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. We, they, they, they set up systems, accountability networks, all these things in order to help them to stay motivated. We can lose our motivation. We, we can drift away from that. And so we encourage one another. Hebrews 10, 25 says, let us not give up the habit of meeting together. Instead, let us encourage one another. We need encouragement. You need it. I need it. All of us need it. You come in here after, the, after a long week of being beaten down and nailed to the wall and <clears throat> accused and harassed, all the things that happen throughout, throughout a normal week in the world. And you just come in and you just, you know, and you're trying your best to sing the songs and, you know, you know yeah, I'm, an, I'm, a, I'm more than a conqueror. And it's just, it's, you know, and part of our job is to get behind you and, and, to, and one another. And we just, we say, you can do it. And we put a, you know, like a spiritual battery charger on you, a negative and a positive, and we give you a, a jolt. That's, that's one of the things I want to do. Just, just, you can do it. And then I want to see you like leaping out, you know, dun, 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 dun. You just run out. I can do it again. And hopefully it'll last for a little while. But we need encouragement. And the Bible says that when, with, the, with the body of Christ, that we fellowship with one another, that we that we pray for one another, we love one another, we show kindness and compassion to one another. We, that's part of the way we get encouraged with each other. It says, let's read this out loud together. Galatians 6, 2. Ready? Let's read it out loud. Share each other's troubles and problems and so obey the Lord's command. It's part of, part of the way we encourage one another. We're, we're in it with them. We, we know their name. We know their situation. We, you know, and it says share one another's. And I've had the opportunity, as many, many of you have. People come up for prayer. They'll come up privately to me. All, and they'll say, you know, I'm in a tough spot. In my, and, you know, so it's never happened to me. And all of a sudden now, you know, my, my job, you know, is this thing's happening. Or someone's suing me. Or, you know, I've got this health problem. Or whatever it is. And I've had the opportunity and the honor just to stand alongside so many of you guys and just pray with you and encourage you. And just like this Bible, you know, like this verse is saying, share each other's troubles and problems. There's something encouraging, you know, that, that, and genuinely. You know, a lot of people in the world, they, they don't, they actually kind of are happy when you're in suffering. If they're driving by and they see you got a ticket, you've been pulled over, they're thinking, oh, it's, about their, it's about time they get something, you know. In, in the body of Christ, that's not our attitude. We, we, we genuinely care about people where they're at. Number two, it helps me develop spiritual maturity. You want to find a church that's challenging you to spiritual maturity. Hopefully, I shouldn't even have to talk about this. Hopefully, you know God wants you to grow in your spiritual maturity. That you, you, should, be, uh, you should know more about the Bible and how to apply it to your life next year than you do today. You should be uh, more plugged in in your prayer life and, and connected with the Lord, you know, today than you were last year. You should, you should be growing in the fruit of the Spirit of love and peace and patience and kindness and faithfulness. All these things should be uh, growing in your life. Let us go on and become mature and understanding as strong Christians ought to be. Hebrew says that he's... Says that in, in 60, Hebrews 6, he goes, listen, you guys came to Christ. You've been growing. Don't fall back to that stuff. You need to be continuing on. Acts 2 says, here's some things, some benchmarks that you can use in your own life. These are four benchmarks he gives about Christian maturity. Acts 2, he says, they were baptized. You can circle that, baptized. And joined the other believers in regular attendance of the apostles' teaching sessions. You can circle joined. They worshiped together. 
circle that, regularly, circle worshiped in the temple and met in small groups, circle that, small groups and homes for communion. Four solid benchmarks. Being water baptized, and we do that here, uh, I guess about every two or three months. We'll be, one's coming up. You can, if you haven't been water baptized, that's the next step for you. And you just write on, write on your connect card and, and, and put it in the, in the clear box on the, on the way out. We'll be sure to get in touch with you. Water baptized. And then join. You're, you're, you're part of that. You're regular attender. And then you worship and you're part of that. And you're in a small group. And there's, these are all benchmarks of, of spiritual maturity. A part of being in a family. You know, sometimes in a family, you don't always do the things that you want to do. You do the things that are best for the family, right? You, that's part of maturity. Ephesians 2.10 says, for we, oh, excuse me, that's, uh, I guess we're ready to move on. Okay, next. Number three, it helps me discover my ministry. Okay, so that's important. Because uh, you have a ministry to fulfill. If you don't, you're going to have this void. You're going to have this, I've, I know I'm supposed to be doing something with my life. I wonder what it'll be. You know, there's, we, we, all of us want to know that we, our lives count for something greater than, than just using up resources, living for the weekends and retire and die. God actually has a plan for you to impact the world. That's why you're alive. That's why he, he, he pre-planned that actually. Before you were even born, he was thinking, I want this person to be on the planet. I'm going to give them these types of skills and talents and gifts so they can accomplish this for me. And part of the church should come alongside and help you to discover that. So you realize my life really does matter. And, here, and here's why. Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. So now circle that, in advance. In other words, before you were born, he decided this is the way I'm going to make this person. And that's how you discover your purpose. The way you discover your purpose is you look at the way God made you, your gifts. God has given each of you some special, special abilities. Now notice he says, be sure to use them to advance your career. Is that what he says? No. But that's what some people, would, that's the way if they were to write it, well, that's what I'm going to use. Any, any special abilities I have, I'm going to use it to make money, advance my career, to get ahead. There's nothing wrong with that. But that's not the main purpose. The main purpose is what? It says to help each other. When you are serving, when you're helping other people with your gifts, with your special abilities, that is ultimately how you Make your life count. That's why we say in the vineyard, every member is a minister. Minister is, just means servant. In this Bible, they're interchangeable. It means you, you, you have discovered your calling to serve and to serve and to serve. And that's where self-esteem comes from. So many people are looking for self-esteem and we have an epidemic of self-esteem in our country. People are looking for status and symbols and, and all kinds of things to Make them to lift their, their sagging self-esteem, trading out their, their spouse and maybe get a younger one, a better model, trying to get more money and get notoriety, all kinds of things to help with their, their self-esteem. But self-esteem ultimately comes from service. When we discover that God's given us gifts and abilities to serve others. I don't think Mother Teresa ever had, had self-esteem issues. She gave up the wealth that was in, she could have inherited so that she could have a life of service. She knew what she was here for. She knew her, her mission. That's where self-esteem ultimately comes from, is realizing God has, wants to use me, and he's, before I was even born, had decided the way he was going to do it. I just need to get in, in, on board with it. In January, we did a, a, a survey that we do every other year. And so if you were here in January during that service, we take about 20 minutes. It's a big chunk of time where we go through this long survey and we want to find out. It's part of the way I figure out, you know, what, what's going on with you. So I'm just, I don't make it up. You know, I, I, it helps me to really understand. So I want to I share a few of the results with you today. One of them is associated with what we're talking about now. We asked this question. I asked this question. Vineyard Community Church encourages 
you, or in this case, you know, encourages me to discover and use my gifts and skills for ministry and service. And 24, 25% said, I agree. 43% said, I strongly agree, which is about two thirds of you said, yes, this is true for me. Vineyard is helping me identify my gifts and use those for service, use those for ministry. And so that's Obviously, there's, there's room to grow there, but it also shows that two-thirds of you, you get it. This is what we're doing. This is what we're about, and this is, this is that's a big part of our church. Ephesians 4.12 says this, God has given pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for Christian service. See, that's part of my job description. My job description, according to God, is, is am I preparing you so that you can do works of ministry? You can do Christian service, and that's part of part of what we give ourselves to. That's part of our mission statement is to help people find and fulfill God's calling on their lives. So that's part of the reason we have Vineyard 301, help you to identify your gifts so that you can get involved and serve there. First Corinthians 12 says, there are different kinds of service to God, but it is the same Lord we are serving. All of you together are one body of Christ and each of you is a separate and necessary part See, you're separate, but you're also necessary. You plug in, much like a jigsaw puzzle. Have you, have you, you've done a jigsaw puzzle. What happens when you do a jigsaw puzzle and, you're, and you come to the end and you're missing one piece? It's hard to enjoy the puzzle, isn't it? You look at it and you think, what do you look at? You don't look at the rest. I mean, a lot of work went into it. You don't look at all those other pieces. You look at the missing piece because that's the piece that's needed. When God created you and put gifts and, and, and when you came to Christ, you became part of the body of Christ and you're needed. You're a separate but necessary part. So you may not realize that, but you're necessary. And the Bible says that, that we're not only a family, but we're a body. And just like a body has different parts and they're all important. In fact, the Bible says that the invisible parts, the parts you don't see, like your organs, and those are actually more important than the visible parts, right? I mean, you know, I like my hands, but I could do without them, but I can't do without some of those organs. I need my heart, you know, I need my stomach. I need certain organs in place, and, and, and you're like that. Some of you play such a necessary part, you're like one of those organs. Could you imagine if your body, if your, if your liver decided, I'm just going to go, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to serve in this body anymore. I'm going to another body. I'm going body shopping. <laughs> have you ever heard that? I'm going to church, church shop. You know, I'm, I'm looking for somewhere. Well, you're, you're a necessary part of it. You're separate. You're different. You're not a heart. You're not a stomach. You're a liver, but you're, you're necessary. Or what if your liver just decided, well, okay, I'll stay here, but I'm not, I'm just going to attend. I'm not, I'm not actually going to actively get involved. I'm just, I'll, I'm, I'm taking up room. I'm here, but I'm not going to serve. I'm not going to do my part. That'd be a problem, right? You need your liver. Liver, come on, man. I need you. You are needed in the body of Christ. You play a vital role. And so that's part of what it means to be in the family of God and part of the body is to say, I'm going to be involved. I'm going to use the gifts that God's given me to help people and serve people. Number four, it helps me to fulfill my mission. A church should help you to fulfill your mission. Everybody needs a mission. God created you for that. And some people, because if they don't have a you know, mission, they'll make one up. So some people, instead of just having sports for a hobby, that becomes their mission. Maybe you know people like that. That's all they do with their life is the sports. Other people, they might pick up like home decorating or something instead of just a hobby. It's now all they think about, all they do. See, we, we're wired to have a mission. If you don't have, if you don't discover God's mission for you, you'll just create one. It'll always be less than God's best for you because God has a mission. Now, now, you may, I don't know if you know this, hopefully you do, but the minute you made a decision to follow Christ, he, our, God has a mission. And so when you follow Christ, you're following in his mission. And he calls us into this mission. That's why it's called the great commission is, is the way we term it. It's because it's a commission because you, you join God in his mission. And his mission is to reach the lost. It breaks God's heart that people are far from him. It breaks God's heart that people go and they die and they enter into eternity without a relationship with him. That's, he, he doesn't want that. 
And so our part of our job, our mission is to join together. Individually, we can't do it. But together, we join together and together we can help reach out. There's nothing more important. Acts 20, 24 says, but life is worth nothing unless I use it for doing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news about God's mighty kindness and love. It's part of what it means. It, it, it would be a shame if for any one of us to go to heaven and nobody there comes up and says, thank you that you told me about, you know, in other words, nobody's there because of you. I, I, when I go to heaven, I want people to come up to me and say, Andy, thank you so much. You were willing to, to be inconvenienced and overcome your fear issues and all the things that your insecurity issues to share Christ with me. And I'm here because of you. Thank you. You risked. You knew the policy procedure at work and you knew this and all of the rules that the world has. You know, I, if we wait for permission to do things, nothing good is going to happen. That's all there is to it. I live my life when it comes to doing good. When I think about, can I serve somebody? If I, if, I, if I see somebody in need at Kroger, I don't go and ask the manager at Kroger, would it be okay if I help? No, I mean, nothing's going to get done. So I just look at it as I'm going to ask for, better ask for, for, for forgiveness and permission. So if I see something, some good I can do to help somebody, and I know it's within God's will, I'm going to do it. I'm not out robbing banks. I'm not talking about going doing stuff wrong and then ask for forgiveness. No, I'm talking about you're doing good. You go and you do. And part of sharing your faith and changing people's eternity is there's nothing more important than that. And so you, 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 you do it. Notice 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. You're an ambassador for God. That's a, that's a big post. If you become an ambassador for a country, God says, you are my ambassador. And we talk about what that means and how to share your faith effectively in Vineyard 401. We also create services here where it's easy for you to invite somebody and they don't get all weirded out. We explain what we're doing. We talk about it. We, we, don't, we try not to use ex words and cliches that make people feel excluded and they're not part of it. And so that's part of your job. It's part of what we want you to do is invite people. Now, we asked you uh, in, in our survey question, we, here's how the question was, is I am inviting other people to Vineyard Community Church on a regular basis. 27% said they're doing that. So obviously there's even more room to grow here. 27% saying, yeah, I'm inviting people. And so if you're, if, if you're outside that 27%, then I'm inviting you to be part of what we're doing here. We're, this is why we, we do our services the way we do them. If it wasn't for a place to invite our services would look totally different. They really would. Our song choices would be completely different. We would have way longer worship experiences. We would use language that's different. We would use we, so our subject matters and how we'd maybe crack open a book of the Bible and really dig deep and spend like, you know, maybe a year just on one book. I mean, we just, you'd, you know, it's just, but we, we do do that because we want you to be able to invite people. So you're going to, so you'll hear, uh, hear about that. Here's another one we asked is, is I am helping other people uh, to grow in Christ. Similar question, a little higher percentage, almost 40%. We are, that's part of what we do is we want to help people grow, understand God's love for them. Okay. So wrapping up, you want to make sure before you get on a bus, you would never just jump on a bus, right? You want to know where's the bus going. You'd look at the front. Oh, that's going where I want to go. That's good. Well, you want to make sure before you be part of a church, you make sure it's going where you want to go. Here's four things you want to make sure are in place. Number one, you look at its statement of faith. You look at its statement of faith and you ask the question, do they believe in the Bible? And that's an important question. 2 Corinthians 3.16 says, All scriptures God breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So you want to, you know, do they believe in the Bible? Do they believe in the Bible plus another little book over here? Do they believe in only their version of the Bible? That's the only one we approve. You know, and it doesn't look like all the other ones. Is it, you know, you know the Bible plus what some other guy 100 years or 200 years ago said? And No, it's just the Bible. It's do they believe in, in, in the Bible? Because that's, that's, that's what we, that's, that should be where you're getting your wisdom, your comfort, your support. 
survey question we ask is, is, am I personally pursuing the Bible as a part of my growth as a disciple? And we had 50, almost 58% say, yeah, that's true about me. And that's, I'm, I'm happy with that. I want it to be more. But 58% are saying, yeah, the Bible is the guidebook for my life. And so for those of you who are in the 40%, I just want you to know, we believe in the Bible here. This is, this is a church that says, we believe from Genesis all the way to maps. You know, we believe, we believe the whole thing because we believe that's, that's God's book to give us wisdom and guidance and support. Number two, uh, look at its style of worship. And you ask, does the worship style help me feel God's presence? Well, there's all kinds of style, right? There's those who worship God must worship him in spirit and truth. You want that. But there's a lot of room for stylistic variance there. I mean, some, some churches, you know, their worship style is, is very emotional and others are very stoic and very calm and collect. And, and as I said, in our church, we're, we, we try to embrace lots of different denominations. We're kind of like Bapticostal or something. You know, we just, we have a blend of all kinds of things. And, uh, it, it, of course, it has to be done in a fitting and orderly way. But some churches do hymns. Some do courses off the screen. And I'm not saying one's better than the other. They're just different. And that's okay. Sometimes people will come up to me and they'll go, you know, I, I, I want you guys to do songs like this. And, or, or I want, you know, why don't you just, we do, Andy, why don't you preach different? You know, I think, you, you know, we're a bunch of sinners. You need to yell at us and sweat with a handkerchief and, and scream and make us feel guilty. And, and I'll just tell them when I hear that kind of stuff, you know, this church probably is not for you. Here's the thing is just find a church where you sense I can grow here. I can, I can sense God's presence here, but then don't try to change it. You know, if you can't, if you can't do that, then go find the church where that, where you, that's true for you. But then just say, okay, that's the church, you know, it's, I'm not going to, I'm not on this hidden mission to change it. We asked this survey question. I feel God's presence as we worship together as a congregation at Vineyard Community Church. Now, this is our highest marks of all of, out of the whole survey. We had 85% said, I agree or strongly agree that God's presence. And this is, this actually has been true for a five year span for us. It was, it's always been high, but it's, it was this high uh, in, in, in a couple surveys back. So that's great. That's what we want. That's what we're shooting for. I still want, I mean, the other 15%, I want you to sense God's presence in the worship. It's, we want everybody involved. And then the strategy is important. Yes, the question, does it take the Great Commission seriously? Does it take this Great Commission of, of where Jesus said, he said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded them. And so are they serious about it? Are they really doing it? Do they equip you? Are, they, are, there, are there services designed for that? Are they, are they about that? Or do they just talk a good game? And that's important. And then the strategy is vital, vital. Uh, the, uh, we had a survey question that asked this, I am sharing my faith with others, evangelizing by means of words, actions, and example. And we had 55, 54% say that was true of them, that they're actively sharing their faith. And I'm, so, I, I want to tell you, I'm proud of you for that. That's, that means you get it. You understand that's part of what it means to be a Christ follower is, is we share the good news with other people. And then number four is it's structure. 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So you ask the question, is there a sense of freedom here? Is there freedom for me to use my gifts the way, that, the way I'm supposed to use them? You know, will this allow me to get involved in a ministry? We say at the Vineyard that you can lead any ministry as long as you've taken Vineyard 301. Because in Vineyard 301 is where you learn about your gifts. And, 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 and we help you to do gift assessments. And then, of course, that builds on Vineyard 201, which is helping you get spiritual maturity, which builds on Vineyard 101, where, you, where we kind of all agree, these are the things that we have, that we're going to agree to. One of those things we agree to is, is that I will, not, I will not hurt the testimony of the church. So we say, if you're going to lead a ministry, you can do anything you want. It just can't hurt the testimony of the church. So if somebody says, well, I want to do a smoking pot for, for, for Christ small group. Well, we're not going to let you do that. 
You know, I guess you do that at home or whatever you're going to do. You know, I can't, but we, we can't have a small group with that because that hurts the testimony of the church. We're in this together. These are the things, that, and you, let me just say this. God wants you to be part of his family. He really does. But this is bigger than just whether you're part of Vineyard Community Church. You are supposed to be part of God's family. And that doesn't happen by going to Vineyard 101. That happens by putting your faith in Christ. Saying, you know what? I want to step over the line from being on the outside and just kind of looking and spectating. I want to be part of God's team. I want to be, I want to be part of that. I don't want to be an orphan, a spiritual orphan. And God doesn't want you to be. He, he says he adopts us into his family. All of us get adopted in. All, there's no one who's born into the kingdom. We're born into humanity. We're born separated from God. And because of Christ, when we put our faith in Christ, he says, I'm adopting you. And so today, for some of you, that's, this is your day to be adopted. It's a great day of celebration to come into God's family. Let's, would you stand with me and I'll close this in prayer. If you've never put your faith in Christ, I'm going to pray with you right now to do that. Would you? Just kind of everybody, their, their heads bowed and just posturing yourself before, in respect before a holy God. Would you say, God, today I want to be part of your family. Right where you're at. God knows what you're thinking. Just kind of in your heart, in your mind. God, today I want to be part of your family. I want to join up and be part of your mission. Thank you that you prepared before I was even born. You prepared the mission that you have for me. And you gave me gifts and talents and special abilities to do that. You say, God, help me not to squander that, but to use that to help other people and to serve. And then some of you, if you've not connected yourself to a local church, I invite you into Vineyard. This may not be the church for you. We don't believe that everybody's supposed to be here. And if it's not, then let me pray for you. Father, I just ask that you, there's wonderful churches all throughout the Hampton Roads area. Bless them, Father. I thank you, Lord, for all of those churches that are proclaiming the gospel, that are, that are built on, on, on the Bible. Lord, we just pray for you, your hand of blessing to be on every one of those churches. And Lord, I pray for those who are called to be here at Vineyard. They come out of the grandstands and they get into the game. They stop just being a tender. They become a member. They stop just spectating. But they say, I want to be part of what's actually happening. So Lord, I just pray, Father, for courage and for reprioritization and re-envisioning. Help us, Lord. I just pray for each person here, Lord, wherever. You, maybe you're in a place where you're just in a funk. And that's kind of keeping you stuck and you're kind of swirling around in there. Lord, I pray for, if, you, if that's you, Lord, I pray that you bring other people alongside them. The verse we read today, people that come alongside and they stand where they share each other's burdens and troubles. Lord, there's something encouraging that comes. There's something powerful that comes when we have other people that come alongside us. Lord, I pray that people in the church, that you would, that you would allow that people to come alongside you and help you in your place of need. Lord, let your hand of blessing and power come. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening to this week's message. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't hesitate to write us your story at amen at vineyardchurch.com and we'll see you next week.